Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Perry Roadhouse. We have an enthusiastic crowd today, I see. So welcome to Perry Roadhouse. My name is Michael Weisberg. I'm the director this year. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. I see many old faces and also many new faces. It's really a, a great pleasure to gather for such an interesting event today. So today's event features Penn alum and the Rockefeller Foundation president, Raj Shah. And today, Dr. Shah, who's a global innovator and leader, will discuss his new book, um, Big Bets, and what it takes to implement a global scale. And I am really delighted to uh, tell you that Dr. Shah, um, beyond being a Penn alum, which is, of course, to this crowd, the, his, his most important uh, accolade is, as I say, the, not only the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, but he served as the USAID administrator under the Obama administration and previously served as the Bill and Melinda Gates at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he created the International Financing Facility for Immunization. Uh, Dr. Shaw graduated also from the University of Michigan, but at here at Penn, he was a graduate of the Perlman School of Medicine and the Wharton School. And I'm really also delighted to introduce the moderator of today's discussion, uh, Kat Rosketa, who is the founding executive director of the Center for High Impact Philanthropy. And she's the faculty co-director of the High Impact Philanthropy Academy at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Social Policy and Practice. So I welcome both of them to the stage and welcome all of you here in the room and on Zoom. Thanks. Hello, welcome. Welcome home Raj to Philly and back to Penn. Um, not surprising you're seeing a lot of friendly faces um, in the audience, given your connection to the university. I see classmates. Um, so I'm delighted um, to be here to moderate a conversation with Raj. Um, you know, as, as the title of his book says, Big Bets, How Large Scale Change Really Happens. Um, this is a conversation about how we can change the world. Um, and what Raj has done is distill a lot of experience um, in the hope that um, it can be instructive to all of us um, and that uh, the kind of change that I know we all seek, um, we can all start moving towards. So um, I'm, I'm, this is a conversation, so I'm going to start the conversation as the moderator. Um, but um, I will leave plenty of time for Q&A so that you can join in the conversation. Um, and I know that we have many, many folks who are joining us via live stream, um, and we'll try to make sure to get as many of your questions answered too. Well, let's just get right into it. Um, so, you know, Raj, you start the book um, talking about the aspiration trap um, and as something to avoid. So in contrast to the big bet that and the big bet mindset you're hoping we all embrace, um, your first message is first you've got to avoid the aspiration trap. So what is that? And contrast that to the big bet. Well, uh, thank you, Kat. And let, let me just start by saying thank you for doing this. Uh, Kat and I have been friends for a very long time, which I could say about so many colleagues that are here. And it is particularly meaningful to get to have this conversation here at Penn, uh, where I feel at home uh, and with you, Kat. And, and the work that you've done with your uh, Center for High Impact Philanthropy is so impressive. And, I, and I'm just so proud of what you're able to do every day. I also wanna just recognize one colleague who's with me who is uh, very much a part of the history of the Perry World House, John Gans. And John, maybe you could just stand up and turn around. There would both be no book uh, without John. He's been an indispensable partner, uh, but also he is a tremendous advocate every day for Penn and for Perry World House. So we are beyond thrilled to be here uh, right on the front end of this this book tour and John's parents are here as well. And we're, we're so happy to have you. Uh, uh, well, so, you know, and, and I wanna thank Michael for the kind introduction that was uh, excessively kind, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> My mom actually believes it. No, no one else really does, but it's, that's okay. Uh, I, I would, I just would say we wrote the book and I wrote the book because I find when you tackle big global challenges, climate change, hunger, poverty, disease, pandemics, or big domestic challenges. The fact that a quarter of American children live in poverty, 
the fact that we succumbed ourselves to a pandemic that we should have been much more prepared to deal with. It is sometimes too easy to feel like doing good is good enough. That if you can do a little bit of good, that's great. It's it feels good and that's okay. And that's that's not a bad thing. But I wanted to present a different way of solving difficult problems. And big bets are about having bold aspirations for lifting up those who are vulnerable, about having a determination to actually solve, not just in a piecemeal way, improve upon some of the big problems we face in our society and around our planet. And it's a mindset that I think can help students and uh, experts and, and others come together to just achieve more on behalf of humanity. And it's a mindset that I think was uh, defined more than 100 years ago in the founding documents of the Rockefeller Foundation, which I now get to represent and lead. It was a mindset I learned from others, including uh, Bill and Melinda Gates when they started their foundation and said, how would we, how would we really prevent children around the world from dying of vaccine preventable diseases, not just a few children, all children, all 104 million kids born every year. It's a mindset that President Obama led when he said, we're going to fight Ebola in West Africa. And even though the CDC is expecting 1.6 million cases and hundreds of thousands in the United States, we're going to send American service members into a hot zone in West Africa for the first time in our history and try to solve this problem there, uh, both to protect lives and to protect our planet. And I found that when I've had a chance to be a part of these big, bold efforts to create change, uh, there's a common methodology to thinking about it, which I try to write about in the book. And that's what I define as big bets. Okay, great. Well, um partly because we've known each other for so long, Raj. I read this book both as a playbook on how to create large-scale change and also as a bit of a professional coming of age for you. And so um, like any good coming of age story, uh, the path is not smooth and you face obstacles. And um, so uh, one, I, I would love you to give us a little bit more on the background of um, of a story that you tell. So this was one of your earlier big bets. And you were at the Gates Foundation at that point. Um, and um, you had your first in-person meeting with Bill Gates, just one-on-one, -on -one, the two of you. You had sent him a memo describing the big bet. It was extremely well-researched, lots of good data. You go into that room. And um, the quote in the book is, the first thing Bill Gates says to you is, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Yeah, that's true. I, actually, there was a little more colorful language. That, <laughs> that so take us back there. What was the idea? What was the big bet? And if that's the beginning of the conversation, how did it go next? Uh, great. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> uh, look, we were trying to figure out how to make sure every kid on earth could be vaccinated. And about at a, with a birth cohort, about 104, 105 million kids a year, only about 60 million kids a year were getting vaccines, most in wealthier economies. And frankly, there was no supply base in the vaccine manufacturing space to even make the large volumes of low cost vaccines it would take to reach everybody. So we were studying this pretty intently and, and we struck upon an idea to create a, a new, uh, really the world's first big social impact bond, which we called the International Finance Facility for Immunization. And it was a somewhat complex structure, but it ultimately was uh, a way to issue debt, uh, raise billions of dollars, contract with these emerging vaccine manufacturers in, in India and elsewhere that could scale up their manufacturing and ensure that there was a supply base to support vaccinating 100 million kids a year for the next two decades. And, uh, and so we put this proposal together uh, and I sent it to, to Bill. I actually sent it to Patty Stonecipher, who was my boss and who, who ran the foundation, said, okay, you should go meet with Bill. The meeting was at the Pierre Hotel in New York uh, because that's where he happened to be. And uh, and so I went in and he enforced, pulls out this memo. He's got red all over it. He's like, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. 
And then he goes through all the different reasons why it wouldn't work. It's not technically legal in the United States to do this. It was mostly going to be about European countries. You'd have to figure this, 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 and this out. And it was a, it was a good 60 minute debate, you know, mm -hmm. and I liked at that point in my career, I loved just getting into an argument. It felt like being Mark Pauly's student here at uh, Penn. <laughs> I mean, you just were there and you'd have to defend everything you say you have to defend. And so, and Bill kind of, that was his way of operating. And what I realized was he, in that hour, basically created a roadmap that, that we then used the next two, three years to solve all of those problems. Ultimately, uh, years later, we created this facility. The first bond issuance, I think, raised about $6 billion. We were able to succeed in restructuring the global vaccine manufacturing space uh, and 20 years later, 980 million kids were immunized, 16 million child lives were saved. And I think that level of scale and ambition and achievement was really only possible because Bill and Melinda had a vision, because thousands of people came together to work together to make that vision real. And because, as I write about in the book, we took some real risks to do some innovative things that made it possible. Yeah, it's a great reminder. Um risks come with costs that can be personal, but it, it, it's sometimes your best allies are the constructive critics, which it sounds like Bill was in that conversation. Um, you then left the Gates Foundation and um, you were at USAID. And um, pretty soon after um, you were confirmed or you took that role, the earthquake in Haiti hit. and. Um, I think you were 36 years old. For the students, that may seem old. For somebody of my vintage, that he's a baby, 36 years old, the head of USA. Um, talk about um, that charge. Well, you know, that, that was a, a really a tragic moment. It happened about a week after I was sworn in yeah. as the administrator at USAID. And the president called and said, Roger, I'm going to ask you to lead this whole of government response, including military assets, because you know there are hundreds of thousands of people whose lives are imperiled. Uh, and, and frankly, he had a vision of, of this moment mattering in the larger narrative of our country, that, that we had to show the world that America's force and might could be used for good and for moral purpose. And so uh, anyway, he, it was a, a dramatic phone call because it was on my BlackBerry. And uh, and I thought I'd drop the call because he basically said, Raj, I'm asking you to lead this, I'm putting you in charge of this, make us proud. And I was ready to take down further instructions and the line went dead. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just accidentally hung up on the president. And then sure enough, he had, he had finished with me. And <laughs> 30 seconds later, he was on television from the, uh, from the press room, <laughs> basically saying, I just spoke to Administrator Shah. I've asked him to deploy the Coast Guard to this with the military. And uh, he went through like 14 things, which then I started writing. Down. <laughs> and, and the next morning, uh, and I write about this in the book also, for those of you that, and for this for students in particular, you know, because imposter syndrome is something that is I've just become quite acquainted with in my life. Uh, but the next morning we had a, a a debrief in the Oval Office, and I got there a little early because you certainly don't want to get there late. And they let me in, so I was in the Oval with the President and the Vice President, Vice President Biden, and I overheard Vice President Biden telling the President, "He's like, are you sure about putting this Raj Shah guy in charge of this effort?" He's like. <laughs> He's like 30 something. He just got here, he, you know, and, and his, his point was that our FEMA administrator, a wonderful leader named Craig Fugate, had much more experience and he was 100 percent right. And uh, and the president saw me. And so Obama came over and was like, Raj, Raj, come sit down. You know, and <laughs> pretend that never happened. Uh, and, and the bottom line is both President Obama and Vice President Biden, now President Biden, have so extraordinarily supportive of, of me and our family that I'm very, very grateful. But those things happen in those moments. I walked out of that meeting. Craig was in that meeting, Craig Fugate. I walked out of that meeting and I grabbed Craig and I was like, I need your help. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chapter in the book on the Haiti earthquake response is called Open the Turnstiles because it's when I learned that you basically, we asked USAID security team to keep the turnstiles open, literally the gates, so that people could go in and out unfettered during the early days of that response. 
because I needed all of these FEMA people and all these military folks and all these HHS folks to be able to come because we simply couldn't do it alone. And we had to accept all the help we could get. So these were people from all different departments. Yeah, all different departments. And I mean, you know, I think history records this, but the the it was the largest humanitarian catastrophe the world had ever seen at that point. At the end of the day, 220,000 people died, which is extraordinarily tragic. But there was also the 21 of 22 ministry buildings had collapsed. The United Nations on the ground had collapsed. Several key humanitarian leaders had perished in the rubble. And in that context, I, I'm very proud of America and President Obama's team, you know, delivered, I think, the largest humanitarian response the world had ever seen. We we're feeding 4 million people. There was more clean water provided so that the diarrheal disease rate was lower six months later than it was the day before the earthquake. The USS Comfort was deployed, and we conducted 22,000 surgeries of some type, including flying people into Miami for limb reattachments and things. And then we had to wean off of all those resources, which I also write about in the book, uh, and invest in building hospitals and health systems in, in Port-au-Prince, one of which was led by Dr. Paul Farmer, an extraordinary hero for many of us in this room, and is still, even with all that's happened in Haiti, a point of pride for helping children survive in that community. Yeah. Um one of the things that was a common theme throughout the book, this notion of opening the turnstiles, because when you're going for that big bet, you need a big team. Um, and sometimes the members of your team are very different from you. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about some of the relationships that um, that you built that allowed you to be able to go after these big bets? Yeah, well, this is a in part, I think, a reference. I think whenever you're trying to tackle something that seems insurmountable, whether it's fighting climate change, or in this case, it was fighting hunger in the aftermath of the 2008 uh, global food crisis, you know, that was a moment when when they were actually the cover of The Economist ran a photo of a young girl eating a mud cake, which is exactly what you think it is. It's cereal grain mixed with mud, so there's a little more satiety. And uh, and it's just just wrong. And so President Obama, basically, uh, we pulled together a global coalition of countries to reimagine the fight on hunger, which has been one of America's strongest leadership points since World War II. And uh, and in doing so, we needed a lot of Republican and Democratic support for this big new initiative. And uh, and. Right around that time, we also lost the Congress. And so there was a rep new Republican Congress. And the first bill of that Congress was a budget bill that would have zeroed out USAID, would have shut down this emerging food and hunger program, and would have uh, shut down actually a lot of our global health programs. And so I constructed, I had my team construct a spreadsheet. I went to Capitol Hill and I testified that you know, with under this new budget, 70,000 kids would die. And I explained what would happen with HIV programs and malaria programs, vaccine programs. And, uh, and then I got back to my office and got a call from, well, I got some congratulations from folks because the way it was reported was it was like, Rod Shaw said, uh, Republican budget kills 70,000 kids, you know, which is, but, and some people like that because they thought, okay, you're being tough, you're being honest, go. Uh, but one person who didn't like it was Speaker Boehner, and he was the Speaker of the House. He was with Tom Vilsack, and so Tom called me and said, Raj, I'm just with the Speaker, and he's very, very upset about your testimony, and you need to go speak to him right away and apologize. So uh, Tom is an extraordinary leader and understands how to bring people together in such a genuine way. So I took his advice. I went. Uh, the Speaker asked me, he said, look, we've spent decades building a strong uh, faith-based Christian conservative coalition to support this humanitarian mission. And you're undermining it by with your comments that are hurtful to people. So here's a list of people to go meet and get to know and apologize to and see what happens. So he gave me a list of like 30 people. I spent the next months doing that. I see some of you here that were part of those missions. And uh, and what came out of that were an extraordinary set of relationships, including uh, with Jim Inhofe, the, the former senator from Oklahoma, who, you know, had adopted a young girl from Ethiopia, cared deeply about fighting hunger. We traveled together. I, he invited me to deliver 
to join the Senate prayer breakfast and then deliver a keynote address at the national prayer breakfast. And uh, probably 10 or 12 Senate Republicans that, that really became good friends and who I got to understand that even though they came to these issues from very different point of view, they cared very passionately. You know, Jim Inhofe famously carried a snowball onto the floor of the U.S. Senate to show that global warming can't be too bad because there's still cold outside. Uh, but but on this <laughs> issue, but on this issue, he was a partner and a friend. And ultimately, we were able to pass the Global Food Security Act, which has now been reauthorized twice, I think is widely credited with moving about 100 million people above uh, from a state of being hungry to being sustainably above that line and has on three different occasions been passed effectively with strong bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. Well, and just a good reminder, dig, dig, dig for that common ground. because Yeah, and, and the chapter in the book that I write about this, I titled it Make It Personal, because at the end of the day, uh, what, what I think brought us together was not our ideas on how to address hunger or ideas about how to execute on global development goals. It was about uh, Jim's upbringing, his Christian faith. It was about, I, I'm Hindu by faith. And it was about us sitting together and praying together around some common values and uh, and and frankly being vulnerable, you know. And so, so I my advice this book has hopefully not too much, but a little bit of advice for people that want to do this type of work. Sometimes we think that just being really smart on issues is enough, and I think to really lead, you have to make it personal and build relationships. Sometimes with people that might have very different worldviews and very different perspectives than you. Uh, and that's hard to do, but it's uh, it's been when I've, I think, had the most kind of fruitful experiences in my career. Um, maybe because of the work we do at the center, I, I can get very cynical about books that are telling us how to create change in the world. It's like, dream bigger, be more ambitious. Um, and so that was the lens that I started reading this book with. Uh -oh. And then, <laughs> um, but then I got to some interesting distinctions that you make. Um, so one is this notion of you can't, um, uh, having a big bet mindset requires a naive optimism, but don't ever fall into naivete. So can you talk a little bit about that distinction? Well, I'm probably not super qualified to talk about that <laughs> distinction because I really believe in in optimism and its close corollary of naive optimism and its close corollary of naivete. Like I feel like too often we we say we know so much that we emphasize what we can't do and what's unachievable. And it takes a determination to say we're going to actually solve these problems to even give ourselves a chance to do so. Uh, there's a chapter in the book that is about a big failure and probably uh, was a result of both naivete and naive optimism. But I tried to, together with a lot of global leaders, including some heads of state in Africa and the Chinese uh, vice premier and President Obama and others, we tried to this was back in 20, 2012, 2013, we tried to build a large hydropower dam in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's called the Inga Dam. And the Inga Dam would have provided enough power for 250 million people to have electricity at around four cents a kilowatt hour, which is incredibly cheap. It would have been the climate equivalent of taking a third of the US auto fleet off the roads. And it would have transformed the economies of a number of large, fast-growing countries, fast-growing by population countries. So it seemed like a no-brainer. The president was excited. Uh, I visited Beijing and raised real resources. We had amassed about $14 billion to do this. And, uh, and then it all dramatically fell apart. Um, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the U.S. Senate passed a rule that basically said, uh, it, it was almost, it was like writing a personal email to me. It was like USAID or the US government cannot build hydropower dams around the world, period. Uh, and then and then I, a few weeks later, I was meeting with the president of the DRC who had a conversation with me in Washington that made it clear that I wasn't going to be able to do this according to the standards we would need to maintain around best practices and transparency and protecting resources. And so the whole thing fell apart. 
And I was the most associated with that project as an advocate. And the lesson I write about is called know who you're betting on, because in that situation, I was betting on, you know, U.S. Senator who I deeply admired and who supported me on a lot of other things, Pat Patrick Leahy, but on hydropower, he wasn't going to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. And I was betting on a particular head of state who I'd been warned about. Uh, but, you know, I thought at the end of the day that like transforming their whole economy and actually showing up with the financing package would change, you know, the behavior and it didn't. Um, and I was just naive about our ability to change other people. Uh, but I don't, I write the story not because I want people to be letting go of na naive optimism. I think, I think you should still be super optimistic. I just think you should do more work. <laughs> and I learned the hard way on really getting to know the people that are important counterparties for these big global efforts. That's the English major in me is saying you intentionally said naive optimism, not optimistic naivete. <laughs> yeah. um, another distinction that you make, and this may be particularly hard for researchers, is um, the distinction between fast data and perfect data. And at least in the real world of creating large scale change, to emphasize the fast data. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, well uh, so often, especially in health and development, uh, and even in domestic efforts that require like serious social science understanding of things we're doing together, we we tend to wait years or, or sometimes even weeks to get data that is highly validated. But then the highly validated data arrives and the, you've missed the moment of, of actually acting on it. And I learned the lesson during the fight against Ebola in 2014. You know, in 2014, Ebola is a hemorrhagic fever. People were, were dying in pretty gruesome ways in Liberia, in Guinea, in Sierra Leone. And the CDC was predicting that we'd have 1.6 million cases of Ebola, including in the United States. And so it was around the fall and it was a big political dust up because, you know, it was when I first learned about Donald Trump as a political figure because he, he was sort of attacking efforts to go to West Africa to fight Ebola on the grounds that it would make us uh, more exposed to that disease. And in that context, the president made a science based decision to deploy American troops to create field hospitals and Ebola treatment units. Uh, and to create the safe conditions for humanitarian actors to go in and, and actually do the medical work of addressing Ebola. But interestingly, nobody actually knew how we would reduce contagion. The disease had a 70% mortality rate. So think about that now that we've come out of, well, we're still in the tail of COVID, but think about a 70% mortality rate. And, uh, and the truth is, the only way people thought about addressing Ebola was taking people who were positive and isolating them. And that became very unpopular because these big Ebola treatment units were places people would go and then never, never come out. Even their remains and their ashes would never come back to the family. So, uh, so we needed to try something new. And the only way we could try something new is if we had super fast data that could tell us what's working, what's not working. So we deployed bioterror labs into rural communities. We used helicopters to transport blood samples the, for, from the World Food Program. And we reduced the time of getting data from days to hours. And then we started experimenting with different strategies. And a group called Global Communities Working in Rural Liberia kind of invented this intervention of a four-person burial team, like dressed in full protective equipment that would go in and remove uh, the bodies of the deceased in a safe way, in a dignified way, and do that before the traditional custom was to wash and hug and pay respects to those who have been deceased. And that turned out to be most of the contagion was happening at that point. So the local community solution ended up rapidly reducing the number of cases. And, uh, and the Ebola cases topped out at around 30,000 cases, about 11,000 deaths. We never had, we had two cases in the United States. I don't think either were transmitted in this country. And American troops came home without a single person getting sick um, a few months later. So it was, I think, a really successful big bet, but only successful because we, we allowed for very fast data, even if it wasn't totally validated, to, to teach us what was working and what wasn't working in real time.
Mm -hmm. I mean, another aspect you just mentioned at the end is not just the fast data, but um, this is a quote from the book. Um, when you talked about the burial practices and understanding that that was a source and understanding changing them would be part of the solution. And the quote is the best innovation was having the good sense to listen to them, to listen to the communities that were most affected. Yeah, I think during emergencies in particular, there's a, there's a tendency to like rely on experts and that's great. And this is a campus filled with experts. So I, I respect expertise, you know, tremendously. But in this case, it was a very local solution that uh, that was defined, designed, and implemented. And it just, because we had a data architecture that let us see it work, we could say, hey, this local solution is working, let's scale it up. And by the time we beat Ebola back, I think we had something like 70 or 80 burial teams in each country, in Guinea and Sierra Leone and in in Liberia, and, and the U.S. was leading in Liberia, but other other nations were were more active in the other countries. But the strategy was the same one, adapted for local nuances. I promised at the beginning that I was going to open up the conversation, so I'm just letting folks know there is a microphone on this side, um, and I'm going to ask my last moderator question before I will open it up to all of you. And I know we've got some folks who can help us um, with the questions that are coming in via the uh, virtual. So um, Gates Foundation, USAID, now president of the Rockefeller Foundation, which is I think the second oldest major philanthropic institution in the United States. And Raj, you and I both know that um, at least in terms of the financial resources available, philanthropy is really a drop in the ocean. Um, you know, uh, what, globally 800 billion, maybe an estimate of philanthropy, contrast that to what's a good benchmark just to give people a sense of a hundred trillion dollar global economy. There you go. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, and yet, um, it can play a really strategic role. One one way people think of philanthropy, and it's certainly the way we think about it at the Center for High Impact Philanthropy, is that um, at its best, it can serve as society's risk capital, society's R and D. Um, now that you are leading one of the major philanthropic institutions, can you talk about what that looks like? Um, what some of the big bets are where you're intentionally using philanthropic capital as risk capital? Well, our, our single biggest bet is the idea that there are still a billion people on earth that live in the dark, that, that consume less than 150 kilowatt hours per capita per year of energy. And to put that in perspective, that is one light bulb and one appliance for the course of a year, and that's it. And frankly, if you have that little access to electricity and to energy, you can't turn your labor into outcomes. You can't create jobs. You can't create a cycle of uplift for your communities. And uh, my predecessor was a president of Penn, Judith Broden, who uh, made a bold decision, I think, about 10 or 11 years ago, and started piecing together these rural electricity systems, electricity generation systems with solar panels and rudimentary lead acid batteries and uh, all kinds of kind of early technology. And they developed a way to provide power to rural communities that had no other choice at around a dollar, dollar 20 a kilowatt hour, which is insanely expensive and totally doesn't scale at that rate. But over the course of time, they innovated. And they, you know, they brought smart metering. They used mobile phone-based payment systems. The price of panels went down. They switched to lithium ion and other battery chemistries for energy storage. They introduced AI-based remote energy and battery management systems and architecture so you didn't need personnel at the sites. And, and, and they started to grow this little commercial operation. And, uh, and they started to get the price down to 25, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, I then inherited this project and basically partnered with uh, a company called Tata Power, a very big Indian energy company that is now committed to building 10,000 of these solar mini grids to reach 25 million people who otherwise live in poverty in parts of India and help them move out of poverty. Uh, and then we, based on the success of that effort and getting the price now under 20 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, we did some modeling and we think this intervention can really help transform energy access for almost a billion people. 
And so we launched the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. We put $500 million in uh, Bezos, Jeff Bezos and I, the IKEA Foundation and a group of other partners also matched that. Um, and then we had raised about $10 billion of uh, development finance, investment fit capital, but not totally commercial investment capital on the backs of that. And it's allowing us to do projects all over the world mm -hmm. that I could not be more excited about. I don't know how many, if any of you have ever been to Eastern Congo, Eastern Congo is an area that's been ravaged by war. And I write in the book about sitting with a group of boys who had been drugged and turned into child soldiers at the age of 10 or 11, and were literally getting their humanity back and being recovered by this UNICEF program in Eastern Congo. There's no electricity in Eastern Congo. There's some diesel generation is all they have. We just closed on a $70 million project to provide, to build out these now metro grids for 100,000 person communities in Eastern Cong Congo. And it took about 7 million or 8 million from us. And the rest is all from commercial and quasi-commercial investors because we innovated the technology and we have the partners and we have the uh, blended finance that we can bring to that task. And based on that model, we're now rolling this out at scale. We're doing, I think, 5,000 grids in Ethiopia, 10,000 in Nigeria, including in the north. The Eastern Congo alone will reach 7.1 million people in that region over time. And, uh, and it's just so exciting. I mean, I can't go to a climate meeting without having heads of state from different countries say, how come you're doing that in Zambia? And what does it take to do that in Rwanda? And, it, and now we're sort of really building on that success. But I think it's a good example because when Judy made her decision to do this, it didn't seem like it made any real financial sense. Mm -hmm. And she was willing to take a lot of risk to try something and stick with it for years. Uh, and, and now we're scaling it up. And I think that's, that's risk capital at its best. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I see we have somebody at the microphone. Here, am I on? Hello? Okay. Um, I'm with the online audience. I'm representing a question that was messaged in. Um, so it says, betting big can look very different depending on a person's career field, but also because of intersecting identities and economic status. Of course, the irony is that the only way to break down structures that make risky decisions more risky for some people uh, is this idea of big bets. How would you suggest we talk about and move forward on this in a way that is not cyclical, but still addresses the reality that for many people, putting big betting big puts their career and livelihood at stake? Well, I think that's a good question, and I would try to answer it in two ways. The first is, uh, you know, I, I try in the book to talk about taking measured risks. And, you know, there are times when I thought I was doing things that would put my career at stake, but I, I almost always, in retrospect, was overestimating that risk. Uh, and what, one example is when, I, when we did that social impact bond, in order to get it, in order to get the UK and France to say yes, I had sort of indicated that if need be, the Gates Foundation would guarantee the securitization, which meant we'd basically pay for it if it went south. Uh, which I wasn't quite authorized to do as a 20-something working <laughs> at the Gates Foundation. So I was really nervous for a long time that, uh, my goodness, uh, this this may not, like if, if this didn't work perfectly, I, I was convinced I'd lose my job. After that whole thing happened, I, I told, you know, I told folks that and they were like, really, you thought you were going to lose your job just because you you know, you stuck your neck out a little bit and tried to push it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I was just scared the whole time. <laughs> you know? And so, so sometimes we overestimate the, the risk uh, personally, but I, but I hope the book offers a roadmap for how to take risks in a more calculated way and a more nuanced way. There's a second thing that that, that question uh, made me think of, which is just the nature of opportunity, especially in our own country. And, you know, I'm, I'm struck, I was with a group at Harlem Village Academies, a, a school that has most of the kids are free and reduced lunch. They're almost all um, of African American or African descent. They are, uh, for many are first generation or second generation immigrants. And I just, they were talking about the book. And I, what I loved seeing was just the spark of energy and enthusiasm and optimism in the that reminded me that a big bets start with betting on yourself. And 
Yeah. Some, for some people that's easier than for others, no question. Uh, but I think we all probably have some experience in our life uh, where we made a bet on ourselves. And we can look back on those experiences and, and, you know, hopefully be proud of the fact that that, that helped nurture a different kind of future. I'll tell you, in my personal case, there was a professor here who passed away recently, doc, uh, Dr. Sandy Schwartz. And I made a bet because I left uh, my medical school program. I see Joanne and Kevin and other colleagues here to go volunteer on Al Gore's presidential campaign. And I got denied like three times from from even being a volunteer. I mean, who says no? There's <laughs> Trooper in the back. He's like, yeah, you did. You got rejected and you were offering to just be a volunteer. I didn't even know you could do that. I thought you just <laughs> walk in the door. And then the campaign was faltering. So they moved it from Washington to Nashville and Trooper back there called me. He was working with Al Gore at the time. And he said, Raj, you send one more letter in and just ask again. And I sent that letter in and they said, we'd love to have you come on down. And I was nervous because I had a scholarship. I was at Penn. You know, it's a pretty prestigious place to be. In case you haven't noticed, I'm primarily Indian American. My parents wanted me to be a real doctor <laughs> uh, and not just someone with a medical degree who can't write prescriptions and do real doctoring stuff. And so I, after my board exams, my then girlfriend, now wife, and I got in our car, drove 14 hours to Nashville, Tennessee, Spent the next six months living in Al Gore's mom's best friend's pool house, not getting paid, driving kids. I was the only volunteer with a car because everybody else was like 15, <laughs> driving kids to the Nashville Public Library so they could copy on microfiche articles about Al Gore's original legislative accomplishments, including his fight against lawn darts uh, way back in the day, for those of you that remember lawn darts. And, you know... It, I, I could only do that because Sandy at one point said, uh, I said, Sandy, I don't have, I can't do this. I can't give up a scholarship and I can't, I need to be a doctor and I, you know, I, I can't do this. And he's like, just do it. This is what you want. Give it a shot. We'll be here for you when you come back. So. Thanks. Please. Thanks Raj for that beautiful memory of Sandy. He always knew what to say and always had the best advice, and I can picture that conversation. Um, first of all, welcome back to Penn. It's really good to have you here. I wanted to ask you, I mean, there's a very large number of different challenging problems around the world that Rockefeller Foundation could tackle, or USAID, or Gates. And I'm wondering, as you think about the various factors that get weighed, whether it's the evidence on what can be done from an effectiveness, cost-effectiveness standpoint, whether it's the unrecognized opportunity for leverage that is out there and that you see and that maybe others don't, you know, whether it's that this is a problem that others are not paying adequate opportunity to and we think we can shed the light on it. How, how have you thought through that uh, in terms of weighing these different factors and what other factors come into play as you think about the portfolio of what to prioritize. Well, thank you, Kevin. And for those of you that don't know, Kevin is an extraordinary scientist, physician here at Penn, leading this huge national effort around food as medicine and bringing the extraordinary research discipline he's shepherded for years to that task. So thank you, thank for, you. for all you do. I think the, uh, you know, it's a little different in government and in philanthropy. And in government, the decision making is a little bit more about what is the biggest challenge you face like right now. So when we had the food crisis in 2008 that I talked about, the way that played out in say the National Security Council was there were 47 episodes of violence, political instability and issues that caused us to meet and talk about national security issues related to countries that were food insecure. In fact, if you remember the the Arab what is what is called the Arab Spring started with a, a young man uh, protesting the access to bread. Uh, and and it, you know it is, it is uh, fundamentally linked to national security. And so we said, look, we have to work on this because otherwise our only response is a diplomatic and defense response that's, that doesn't feel right for, for the actual problem. 
Ebola, Haiti, those are things that you just have to deal with in that moment. You have to decide are you going to do or not do. I'd say in philanthropy, you get to be a little bit more selective. And so all the criteria you just mentioned, are there fresh? And I write about this in the book as, as sort of what makes for a big bet. Are there fresh, innovative solutions that you believe can work? You said cost effectiveness, uh, which is part of believing it can work, but you have to believe it can work. Too often we harp on the problems and we don't talk about the actual solutions. Food as medicine, for example, is an exciting solution to a problem of widespread chronic disease that made Americans you know, very vulnerable to high mortality rates from COVID, right? We look for, our, can we build unlikely partnerships that will change the ability to scale? Sometimes that's leverage, as you pointed out, um, and sometimes it's, it's different kinds of partnerships, but um, I'm a big believer in, in bringing together people who wouldn't otherwise sit together in, in these unlikely partnerships. And the final one we really think a lot about is the one around measuring results. Like we can't do everything when we're putting $500 million into a single project, which is the biggest grant we've made in 110 year history. Like we have to know that we can measure the results. And I can show you data from the India program over a decade that shows, okay, what happens when these mini grids go into a community? Who's buying the power? What do they do with the power? Are more girls going to school? Incomes are going up, jobs are being created. All of that becomes sustainable. Commercial partners come in and buy into these businesses. So we need that data and that data measurement uh, to exist. And that doesn't mean things that you can't measure are not worth doing. It just means for us making this kind of these kinds of big bets we emphasize those things where we can measure the results. Thank you again for your time today. Um, so at least to me, the idea of big bets sort of brings out, you know, the idea of big change being the result. How do you sort of go about keeping the faith and making big bet after big bet when you're working in a system or, or a situation where small incremental change is kind of the, the result that keeps happening? Well, that's a great question. I, I think I think this those uh, practical I mean those small incremental changes can also be thought of as you know practical steps towards big bets, right? So we have a big bet to reach a billion people with renewable energy and electrification and technology that hasn't existed before that we think will make a huge dent in extreme poverty around the world. And we're going to pursue it for decades if need be. Uh, but the first projects are, you know, three metro grids in Eastern Congo or 50 grids tied to irrigation pumps in parts of Ethiopia to improve the productivity of agriculture. Like those, what, what you might call incremental actions uh, within the context of a big aspiration are in fact, uh, both are true, that they are part of our big bet and they are you would look at it and say, well, that's a small incremental step forward. Uh, but if you don't keep in mind that all of this is for the purpose of reaching a billion people and largely reducing energy poverty on this planet and doing it in a way that'll displace 75% of future global carbon emissions, you know, you you then you're just doing small incremental projects or pilot projects, and those, and then you have no chance of scale. You know, so I think you have to you have to embrace both uh, with real real commitment and real rigor. Hello, another question from our online audience: um, What do you see as the division of labor between development aid and philanthropy? Well. Uh, well, well, development aid, this was Kat's point earlier, development aid is probably $130 or $140 billion a year transfer of uh, that we call development assistance, official development assistance. I'd say global international philanthropy within the $810 billion that Kat mentioned must be less than $10 billion. Uh, and I'd say half of that, if not more, is from one institution, the Gates Foundation. So it's not... Uh, it's really not comparable. And the needs, of course, are in the trillions. So helping economies transition their energy economies, for example, has been estimated across 81 countries, not including China, but including India, as about a $2 trillion a year expenditure. So honestly, our work is what Kat said. It's about risk capital. It's about ideas. It's about building alliances and then about advocating for others 
to insist on taking these things to scale. Like right now, we're all gearing up to participate in this year's climate negotiation, which is called the COP in Dubai, uh, the Committee of Parties, I think is the official term. But but you know, th this we're we're about to go to a climate a global climate negotiation hosted by a country and its oil minister that have done very well over the last two years. And windfall profits in the oil industry to petro states alone have been, well, to in the oil industry overall in the last two years have been two and a half trillion dollars. And 80% of that has gone to five or six petro states. So, you know, uh, I feel like we have a solution we're advocating for. They have resources that they ought to be investing in my mind in accelerating these solutions at scale. And our job is to stitch together those partnerships so that we can actually win in the long run. Sorry, sorry. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about Afghanistan um, and the big bet that was made on state building in Afghanistan um, that you know clearly at least has not uh, yielded the results that anyone hoped. Um, and then I was also hoping that you could give some advice to the students in the audience. Um, you talked about making a bet on yourself. Um, but, you know, as, as you, I'm sure, recall well, and, and many of us recall well, you know, you sit in, this, in an audience like this with an alum who comes back and you think, how on earth can I go from being in the audience to being on the stage? And what, you know, real concrete advice would you give students around that? Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. And, and you know, on, on Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan was our largest aid recipient for throughout my tenure. And uh, even though the total cost of the war meant that our development aid to Afghanistan was about 2% of the total civ mill effort, uh, it still was our single largest investment of development assistance. And I'm, I write about this in the book, and I'm, I'm torn about it for two reasons. The first is, obviously, the project of building a nation state in Afghanistan failed, and, uh, and we turned it back over to the Taliban. And the things we fought aggressively for, the dignity of women, opportunities for girls, uh, educational opportunities for, for everybody, female representation in the Afghan parliament, all of that proved relatively unsustainable. And the government, whether it was President Karzai's or uh, Ashraf Ghani's, simply couldn't handle overcoming the extraordinary corruption created by the amount of money just flowing around Afghanistan. Some, and, and that was not development assistance money, actually. The development assistance money at 2% the cost of the war was pretty firmly tracked and expended by partners and contractors and the like. But, you know, there are many other elements of intelligence and military contracting activity and other things when you have, you know, 25 national partners, you cannot uh, avoid the level of corruption. And I think those two leaders and their governments never got a handle on actually what it means to serve their populations. Now, our military leaders, David, I write about in the book, our military leaders kept insisting right, that we do the things that serve the population. And the number one thing on their list was provide energy and electricity, keep the lights on, turn the lights on in Kandahar and Kabul and all over the country. And I write about, I write about that. I think those big efforts were less effective. The thing that I am proud that America did in that window of time was get 8 million girls into school, was get, you know, uh, enough girls into graduate school and undergraduate college to, to create basic expectations. And I always hoped that that single achievement would sustain a different kind of society in Afghanistan. And I think it's gone backwards quickly since the Taliban took over. I am still hopeful that that investment will pay off in the long run, simply in terms of a modicum of gender equity and opportunity uh, that creates more stability over time. But to me, it's a big lesson that you simply can't impose, you can't build a nation where its leaders are not trying to build the same nation you're trying to build. And it has to be led at home. And in that case, it just wasn't. And it cost America dearly. Um, I will say, one of my, not to do advertising, but one of my proudest moments at the Rockefeller Foundation 
was when uh, when the planes were stuck on the tarmac at Kabul, and there was that hectic evacuation in August a few years ago. Our teams put together charter flights, chartered airplanes, and allowed more than 800 uh, women civil society leaders to escape Kabul. And they they would have been targeted. They were known. They ran NGOs. They ran programs. And there are not a lot of places that have the courage to charter aircraft in a war zone. And uh, I'm not saying this for me, but my my team, uh, including the people who made that happen, I just think are extraordinary. And they did that while they were on vacation, you know, in in August, because uh, disasters and crises always happen in August. By the way, in case, <laughs> if you want to be in this business, plan your vacations in June. Uh, so anyway, that's that. On the advice for students, I, I would just say uh, a couple things. One is I got a lot of benefit from. I mentioned Kevin. I mentioned Sandy. I mentioned Joanne. I mentioned so. There's so many people in the Penn Trooper in the in the Penn environment that served as anchors for me and role models for me. And so one, and then I had that at Gates too. I happened to join Gates when it was so small that I got to know Bill and Melinda and I could learn from them and learn how they thought. And I was exposed to leaders that I write about in the book. But I also met people in developing countries running these NGO projects that you haven't heard of that were also inspiring. And so my advice to young people today is in terms of kind of your career is, Sometimes we think a lot about what we're going to do, what our tasks are going to be, and we think less about who we're going to learn from. And I would just ask, as you look at your next job or your next opportunity, make sure you are going to be surrounded by people you can learn from, that you respect, and that because they're going to shape your mindset for years and years and years to come. And that I think is particularly true in your 20s and 30s. Uh, and I, I would just advise you to think hard about who who am I going to be learning from in this environment and what what kind of mindset will I have as a result of that? And I got lucky and uh, both because I have amazing people at Penn, but also because I got to work with amazing people after I left Penn. And that mindset is what I call a big bet mindset. And it's it's why we did the book. So we are at time. Um, okay. But um, a great message to end on. And just, I mentioned my like somewhat skepticism about books that are trying to encourage people to create change. And I actually found in what I recognize is a very heavy time for people um, that this book was hopeful and energizing. So thank you, Rob, for your work. I'm thank you, Kat. Thank you, thank you. So I also want to add my thanks. Uh... Raj and also Kat for your really excellent moderating and really for keeping this discussion really lively and forward. It's really a great pleasure to welcome you back again to Penn, Raj, and really nice to hear you mention all these names. I actually lived in a college house where Sandy Schwartz was the uh, faculty director, so we have Sandy in common too. Um, thanks again to the audience, both online and uh, in person. Three quick announcements. The first is that next Tuesday at 12.15, Michael Mann will be um, doing a book talk on his new book. I hope that all of you will come back if you'd like to come back too and get a copy of Mike's book. I'm sure he would love to talk to you about climate change. The second thing is we're going to have a signing table in the back if you'd like to take your book and have uh, Dr. Shaw sign it. Uh, I'm sure that his hand will uh, hold out for all hundred of you in the room. And the last is there's a reception in the back and please join us in that reception. Again, let's thank our wonderful panel.